dear God, I come to you again in humbleness, with respect, with grace, and with love. And I need you to help me to be a better person, Hashem. Even though I do everything in my power to be better, I still need your assistance, you understand? And I want the people to understand that so that they know it's okay to ask Hashem for help. It's not a bad thing. You understand? Just like to fear God, people try to make you think like fearing God is a bad thing. Oh, you're not going to pressure me. You're not going to do What do you mean we're not going to pressure you? When you see the cops with a radar gun, you slow down. You're not complaining about that pressure. So why are you complaining about this pressure? Because of your ego, because of your pride. You understand? Put your pride down. Go to Hashem. Ask Him for help. How many people do I help when they lose something? You know why? Because I see them looking for something, but none of them ever ask God. Like none of them stop and say, Dear God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, can you please assist me and help me? Because I need you right now. And I just want to let you know that I'm going to try my best to fix what I need to fix. You do that, the chances of you finding your keys just rose a billion percent. You know why? Because you rely on God. You know what it's like? You know when you have a, a friend and you play the trust game? You know, you just fall back and there's somebody there and they catches you? That's how you have to be with Hashem. You have to be mamash, be willing to stand on the Empire State Building and jump backwards. Not even forward, not even looking down, bro. Not even looking and just fall back. And I promise you, promise you, He will catch you. You know why you never see it? Because nobody has, nobody reached that level that they will go up there and do that. A miracle will happen. I can almost guarantee, of course I don't know because I, I can't judge you, but I know God. And I'm telling you that if you really went there, lishma, to show the world. Like, I don't know, you did it on pay-per-view and you said, listen, I'm just going to show you. And they'll show. There's no, 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 no parachute, no straight, no nothing. And everyone's going to say, oh my God, he's going to die. He's going to die. He's going to die. And you're going to see some way, somehow, I don't know, bro, a wind will blow. He'll fall, but he'll land on grass. I don't know, bro. I don't know what to tell you. Somebody will be coming with a moving truck with a double king size bed. I don't know. Double pillow deluxe. He'll fall on the bed. I don't know what to tell you, bro, but I'm telling you. That when you trust God, that's it. That's it. That's heaven. That's what you need to get to. You need to get to a level in this world that you really trust God. That you don't sue somebody. You don't fight. You don't go to war. You don't get revenge. You put your ego down. You make peace and you keep it classy. That's what you do. You see, if you were my son right now standing in front of me, I would say, listen, let me give you some good advice in life. Don't ever care what people think don't ever show people your weakness ever because once people know your weakness they're gonna attack you look at all the bullies they look to see what gets you mad and they attack but if the bully sees that nothing gets you mad like in my book I wish I was a nerd read that book and then you can understand how the nerd in the beginning got mad when he was getting bullied and then I told him what are you getting mad why because they're calling you a nerd I wish I was a nerd he said why would you want to be a nerd I said, because God loves nerds. What do you think? They're humble. They're kind. They're smart. They're intelligent. They don't talk back. They respect their mother and father. I'll go down the list. They'll help the world with their intelligence. What are you kidding me? God loves nerds. He said, you know what? You're right. I said, good. The next time they call you a nerd, laugh. No, no, they're going to beat me up. Yeah, maybe they'll keep attacking you for a little. But if they see 100% that you know that God loves nerds and that every time you call them a nerd, that they call you a nerd, you benefit from it, they will stop. They will stop. If they knew every time they called you a nerd and you didn't get upset and you got a reward for that, they would stop doing it so you don't get your reward. You understand how deep Hashem will take it? That's why it's in your best interest to know that when God is on your side, not even the bully can bully you. And by the way, to the bully, just want to let you know, man, that if you bully people, God will send someone to bully you. I was telling my father today with the story of the Sotad, the woman that cheated on her husband, and she has to drink the water, and then her, her face turns green, her eyes bulge out, 
her thigh distends, her stomach collapses, her hair gets untangled, uh, gets tangled, and every punishment she got was for a sin she did. She played with her hair. So they uncover her hair and expose her. They put her in front of the temple courtyard, just like she was by the doorway seducing the man. Her face turns green because she wore makeup. Her eyes bulge out because she probably, she was putting, you know, for her eyelashes, whatever you call it, eyeliner or whatever, to make your eyelashes all pretty. Well, everything is connected, you understand? And that's what you're not getting, bro. The thigh distends, you know what? The stomach distends and the thigh collapse. The stomach descends because... The stomach swells because her stomach and his stomach were touching in an impure act. So the punishment is her stomach swells and her thigh collapses. You know why her thigh collapses? Because she exposed her inner thigh. She opened her legs, God forbid. And then that's why her thigh collapses. You understand? It's very deep how Hashem is taking it, yo. You need to get that through your head, yo. And I'm going to show you how deep it is. I'm going to tell you about my boy that I met the other day. Chris M. Flores. Hopefully he'll listen to this. Yo, this kid... Let me tell you so I don't get impressed that easily, yo. And this kid impressed me. You know why? Because I was in a store. No need to mention the name. Just let you know it was owned by Jews. Israeli Jews. And the chutzpah and the arrogance of these Jews. These are the type of Jews. Or this Jew in particular that I'm going to describe is the type of Jew... That God forbid will bring a holocaust on the Jews. I know a lot of them. Horrible people. Nasty, rude, arrogant. Terrible. So I come in to tell my, sell my t-shirts. And I walk up to her. I say, are you the owner, the manager? She goes, yeah, how can I help you? I said, well, listen, I sell t-shirts. And she was like, oh, no, we're not interested, not interested. I said, but you didn't even see the t-shirt. No, no, I'm not interested. I don't, I don't do anything with t-shirts. And I look around, the whole store is filled with t-shirts. And not her brand, like other brands, you know what I mean? So I'm like thinking to myself, why would she not even uh, at least give me the courtesy? To, like, why is she being so rude? As I put my head down to walk away, I see this guy walk in and he's like, excuse me, are you guys going to pay me? And he's talking to this girl. So I'm thinking to myself, all right, this is, I'm interested. So I stand there and I listen. And he goes, are you going to pay me the $400? I worked for you all last week. Pay me. What's going on? Why are you guys not paying me? I came to you guys, I asked you to pay me, you ignore me, I'm coming back and I'm saying, please pay me. You owe me $400. She looked at him, bro, like he was a piece of trash. And then he realized, I guess he wasn't getting his money, he put his head down, put his ego down and walked out. So I looked at this lady and I said, there's something about you that irks me. I don't like you. So you know what she says to me? She looks me in the eye and she walks up to me, she goes, is there anything I can help you with, sir? <laughs> fake, 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 so fake, fake. So I said, nah, God willing, you'll never have to help me ever. And I walked away. And when I went outside, I met this kid, Chris. Turned out to be one of the nicest kids I ever met. Yo, a pure neshama, bro, pure soul. A spiritual Gentile, bro, and I love these kind of Gentiles. And it's not even a disrespect, Gentile. Gentile just means other nations, like Goyim. They think that Goyim is like bad. Goyim just means nations. We're called Goy Kadosh, a holy nation. That's what we're called. Do we live up to that? Absolutely not. Absolutely not, man. I'm going to show you now how we don't live up to it. When I read you parts of Echa, you're going to faint, God forbid. But let's start with this. The merit attained for teaching Torah to another man's offspring is immense. According to the Talmud, if one teaches Torah to another man's son, he gains the privilege of attending the academy on high. Amen. God instructed the Levites to safeguard the temple and the tabernacle. No one was allowed to approach this area or they would be killed by God. God instructed the nation to set aside a tenth of their wealth, which would be used to give to the Levites. The census that was taken in the book of Bamidbar was of all the men over the age of 20. The Levites were counted separately and God said count every male over the age of one month. I like this. Somebody said this the other day and I took it because I love it. And when you take wisdom and spread it, it's a blessing. I choose love because hate is too big of a burden to bear. I like that. I choose love. I got to put that on a t-shirt. I choose love because hate is too big of a burden to bear. 
the law for redeeming the firstborn was taken from when God took away the firstborn from Reuven and gave it to the Levites. The Levites were amazing. You know why? The Levim, I'll tell you why. Because they didn't participate in the sin of the spies and they didn't participate in the golden calf. Two tragedies in the Jewish nation and they did not partake. When the Jews were slaves in Egypt, the women helped their husbands produce their daily quota of bricks. This is a little tough, so pay attention. Pharaoh increased the quota and refused to give the Israelites straw, making their task even more demanding. Once a woman miscarried, in order to fill her required quota of bricks, she placed the fetus in the trough of cement and formed a brick. An angel immediately came, took the brick, and was overcome with pity. And he brought the brick to God, and he said, God, see what has become of your children. Look at them and show mercy. And God did. And it's not that God didn't have compassion already. It's just to lay out the story to let you know that just like the angel had mercy, you should have the same kind of mercy. It should break your heart in half. You understand? Now I'm getting into the book of Echab. Really, but Ahmed, man, I hope. Just prepare yourself because some of the things I'm going to read are tough, man. In the book of Echab, chapter 2, verse 3, this is what it says. In his fierce anger, he cut down all the glory of Israel. He drew back his right hand from the enemy. Give me one second because I didn't put his with a capital H. I like that. He drew back his right hand from the enemy. He burnt through Jacob like a burning fire, devouring on all sides. In the next verse, it says, And God bent his bow like an enemy. Think about what God is saying. Think about it. The prophet Jeremiah, is, is, this is what he's describing. God bent his bow like an enemy. Yo, God is the enemy of the Jews. Yes. When, they go, when they're his enemy, he'll be their enemy. No problem. I told you, it's all measure for measure. Get it through your head, man, before your head gets measured. You know what I mean? And God bent his bow like an enemy with his right hand set as a foe. He slew all those of pleasant appearance, meaning the high priest. He poured out his rage like fire in the tent of the daughter of Zion. Wow, wow, wow. The Lord was like an enemy. He swallowed up Israel. He swallowed up all her palaces. He destroyed her fortresses. And he multiplied their lamentations and their mourning. Wow. The lost ten tribes were swallowed up by the other nations when they were exiled. In case somebody asks you. King Se now, This is really sad, bro. This is probably... The worst punishment I ever read in in, uh, in Chazal Tanakh in the Gemara. This is, I believe, in the Book of Judges, if I'm not mistaken. King Sedkia suffered the tragedy of having ten of his sons slain before his very eyes, and Sariah, the high priest, was brought to Nebuchadnezzar and killed before him. In Deuteronomy, Moses said that Hashem was very angry with Aaron after what happened with the golden calf. Aaron was always full of love, but in this situation, it called for much more strictness. And since he didn't do it, the people took advantage. This just teaches us when people become cavalier in front of God, you must reprimand them in a stern but classy way. Let me say that again, because this applies to the world today. When the people get out of hand and cavalier in front of God or in the face of God, you must reprimand them in a stern but classy way King Sedkia 10 of his sons Slain before him Why? Because he started a revolt Against Nebuchadnezzar Neb Nebuzardan You're going to see some stories About Nebuzardan That's craziness yo. In Deuteronomy Moses said that Hashem Was very angry with Aaron As I said before The word walls Is written chamot You know why? It's written in the shorter form Without the vav To teach us that God left The western wall which was built by the poorest of Jews. Amen. When the Babylonians entered the temple courtyard, the Levites were chanting from Psalms 94. They were reciting the last verse where it says, He will turn their violence against them and destroy them through their own wickedness. And Hashem is talking about the Jews. Yo, 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 yo. Hashem, listen to me. Hashem, 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 listen to me. Please, I'm begging you, listen to me. For any sin I ever committed against you, big or small, I'm asking you now to forgive me. I know you won't, and I know I'll have to pay for some of them, and I know a lot of them I fix, and even the ones that I'll still have to pay for, the punishment will be reduced. I'm telling you, Hashem, 
please forgive any sin I ever committed against you. There's no way, bro. There's no way, no way, no way to be selfish like that. No way to be disrespectful like that. No way to be ungrateful like that. He is your father. He gave you life, man. It's like if, you're, if your biological father brought you a mansion with 50,000 cars and $5 billion in the bank, you would have to be grateful to him. If not, you'd be the most ungrateful person. I think everybody agrees. What Hashem is giving you, your nishama is worth more than all of that times a billion times another billion, times another quadrillion, and you still didn't even counting how much the soul is worth. Are you kidding me? You have to have gratefulness for God, bro. You sin, Hashem understands. Fix it. Work on it. Help other people to overcome the same sin that you struggle with. I'm telling you right now, man, put your ego down and make peace like my boy Chris. Chris M. Flores. Go check out his page on YouTube. He got a song, I Love You The Same, and I love that song. Such a nice kid, man. And that's how I met him, man. I was attracted to his soul. You know why? Because he put his ego down and made peace. Amen, man. May God bless him. I told him that. I said, God is going to bless you for that. And you want to hear another amazing story about him? I said to him, look how much God loves you. He was dating this non, this Jewish girl. He came from L.A. They got into some fight and he kind of got kicked out. And her family took him in. You understand? Beautiful. So I was like... Thinking to myself, look at the way Hashem runs the world. You look at the Jews, right? Look how I criticize. They're arrogant, they're this, they're that. But here's a story of a guy who happens to be dating their daughter or their his sister, the brother, I believe it was, helped him. And they know she's not maybe a good person or she's going through some stuff and like, you know, Chris is suffering for that. And right away they offered to help him. That's beautiful. So you see on one side, Jews that are arrogant. And in the same token, you have Jews that will come and take in a stranger that they don't even know. And that's why I love my nation, because it's like every other nation. You got good and bad. The difference is when you have bad in the Jewish nation, it sticks out like a sore, dumb, real bad. It's like white on black. It just sticks out, yo. You're going to see it, and people are going to talk, gossip, and do a lot of malicious speech about the Jews. And that breaks my heart, yo. I'll be honest with you, yo. Ay, ay, ay. The Jews erected walls and fortresses, but they didn't realize that repentance and good deeds, rather than walls and fortresses, protect the Jewish people. That is beautiful. Pay attention to what I'm reading you. The Jews erected walls and fortresses, but they didn't realize that repentance and good deeds, rather than walls and fortresses, protect the Jewish people. Jeremiah 9.12 It talks about how the sages weren't able to answer why Judah was destroyed. Then God said from a heavenly voice, it's because they have forsaken my Torah. Don't you get it, yo? Evil is rampant amongst the youth because they're far from the Torah. This you can't dispute. It's one of my old songs. It's so true. One of the best solutions to the problem we have in the world today is to cry to God to bring Mashiach. Remember earlier I said about asking for gifts? That's asking for a gift. Hashem, Hashem, it's heading to a horrible place. It's heading to a holocaust. It's heading to where, God forbid, there's going to be such famine that women are going to eat their children. God forbid that I can even talk like that. And you're going to tell me you're fanatic, you're crazy, you're making this up. God would never do it. Go read Parshas Kitavo. Come on, man. Are you kidding me, man? The Jews don't even know what's written in the Torah. If the Jews knew what was in the Torah, they would work on themselves like I do. They would do their best to humble themselves. When they sin, they'll cry out to God with a broken heart and beg Him for forgiveness. And they'll do everything in their power to put that compass in the right direction to get to the highest level they can attain spiritually. Amen. Generally, a person's internal organs are only affected when he does not release his suffering, I like that, yo, that's dope. I think it's Achi Shena, like King Solomon said. Get it off your chest, talk about it, Sikha, have a conversation. Not good to hold it in. You hold in the suffering, it's going to affect your internal organs. Wow. The pain a person feels over the loss of a child, God forbid, lo aleinu ever, is the greatest sorrow one could feel. But at the same time, it saves them from hell. Think about that. Crazy. 
crazy. That's the justice, but you don't even see it. Because you might, God forbid, lose your kid and not even understand why. That's happened to many people. They don't understand it's for not keeping Shabbat. They don't understand that. And I, here, I show you. Listen, listen. Let me show you, and then you tell me if I'm wrong. You can 100% disagree with me. Let's just say there was somebody that didn't keep Shabbat and knew about Shabbat and like arrogantly like didn't keep it. So if Hashem would come and take their child or her child or his child, where's the justice? I'll show you where the justice is. God gave you the child as a gift. He also gave you the seven days of a week as a gift, right? And he only asked you for one day back. And you couldn't give him that one day back. So he took back his gift. I know it sounds crazy the way I'm explaining it. But if you really know God, that's exactly how it works. Now, I don't know, because I don't know everything that happened to you, and I don't know your life, and I don't know nothing. But I know if you lost a child, it's for something you did wrong. It has to be. Hashem would never do that, ever. He's not going to punish you for no reason. So you have to look at what you did wrong. How many people I know that break Shabbat, and I'm telling you, the Gemara says, Shabbat is the source of all blessings. You keep Shabbat, it can save you from a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff. The one thing it won't save you from, though, I'll tell you what it won't save you from, from being prideful and arrogant. That it will never save you from. Never. Because that means your Shabbat wasn't pure. How could you keep Shabbat perfectly and be arrogant to another human being? Yeah, you'll keep Shabbat. No, no, he keeps Shabbat. Oh, he keeps Shabbat. I don't care he keeps Shabbat. He's arrogant and rude. His Shabbat means nothing, bro. What do you think? I'll prove it to you. Because even when he's crying out to Hashem on Shabbat or keeping Shabbat or reading the paper or not, you know, watching TV, he's still arrogant. And Hashem will reward him for his Shabbat. But if you think he's waving the arrogance, you're tripping. The sanctuary in the desert was referred to as the tent of the meeting. Sanctuaries were later erected in Nov, Gibeon, Shiloh, and Jerusalem. Jerusalem is referred to as the city that was called the perfection of beauty and the joy of all earth. Amen. And God destroyed it because of our sins. Oh my God. And the same sentence that I'm thinking of the beauty of Jerusalem and the power. Go by the Western Wall. You can be 100% secular and I promise you, you're going to feel the presence of Hashem. And hopefully later Hashem will let me tell you this story about Shulamit and the Western Wall. The numerical value of perfection of beauty equals Jerusalem. Klelot Yofi. Wow. In general, joy and beauty come from appreciating a supernatural dimension. Mere lines or color tones in a painting do not by themselves make it beautiful. Rather, a beautiful picture is determined by the success by with which the artist uses those forms to convey an inner message. Look how beautiful that sounded, Joe. In general, joy and beauty come from appreciating a supernatural dimension. Mere lines or color tones in a painting do not by themselves make it beautiful. Rather, a beautiful picture is determined by the success with which the artist uses those forms to convey an inner message. It's not the physical object that brings joy. It's the feeling it invokes. Now I'm going to tell you <laughs> a story that I love. There were two best friends that were suspected as being spies. And the king told them that they have 24 hours to pay his ransom or he will execute one of them. So the two friends were like in shock. So they agreed that one of them was going to go and get the money. So he goes. He actually collects the money. He comes back, but he's a minute too late. It's past the 24th hour. And he sees the king telling the executioner to kill his friend. So he throws down the money and he runs and he jumps in front of the sword. So the guy that was supposed to be killed pushes him out of the way and says, No, 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 kill me. And then his friend pushed him and told the executioner, no, no, kill me. And they started to fight over who the executioner should kill. And the king is watching this like in amazement. And he's a nasty, dirty person. He likes to kill. And he's watching this and he can't believe his eyes. 
how they're both willing to kill each other. That's how close they were as friends. So the king yelled out to the executioner, stop! And you know what he ended up doing? He brought both of these two guys, both of them, into his kingdom, made them ministers in his palace, and had him teach all his subjects how to have the same love that they had for each other. And that's what saved their lives, the love that they had for each other. And that's the love the Jews should have for each other. Because when the Jews have love for each other like that, think about how many Jews can help Jews right now and they don't. I can tell you in my life, rabbis, I won't name them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I'm not even lying to you. Eight. Eight that I can just think of in five seconds. Jews that can help you and don't even help. Ten, nine, ten. Ten, beautiful, nice, nice number. Ten. How ironic, the Ten Commandments, bro. Ten rabbis can help and don't help. And that's the rabbis, the people. Then there's people that can help that don't help. Then there's people that can help will play with you. <laughs> ah, now Hashem is going to play with them, bro. So nuts how this world works, bro. How many people I know, I'll just tell you like this. I sent my book to a couple of schools. They don't even write back, bro. The arrogance and pride is beyond disgusting. They don't even... Just write, you're not interested. Say, the book is nice, but we're not interested to bring you in to feature the book and to, you know, promote your book and give the kids a beautiful speech on bullying to help the school. We're not willing to do that. I don't even know what they could say. Maybe they didn't read the book. Maybe, I don't, I don't know what it is. All I know is that when you email somebody, and believe me, I have the right email. When you email somebody and you're a boss or you're in charge, you email back, bro. Because if you don't, one day you're going to email God and he's going to ignore you. And then you're going to really know what time it is, yo. Sick. You have no idea what's going on, bro. But you'll figure it out one day. You know why? Because God is going to make you eat your arrogance and pride. And if it's just you forgot because you were careless, that's also not good. But I would love you a billion times more if that was the reason. And you know when I would really respect you the most is when you would write me and tell me why you don't want to feature the book or what happened. Oh, I, did, I just got your email. I'm so sorry. And some of them you follow up with and they don't even write back. They don't even write back, bro. These are rabbis in the community, bro. Horrible, man. That's really embarrassing. That's why Hashem already put in my head not to work for anybody, bro. Work for yourself, you know what I mean? I'll be my own rabbi to help the kids. I'm not even a rabbi, bro, but you know what I'm saying. I'll be my own teacher to the children and make my own little mini homeschool like I've been wanting to do. It'll pop off when Hashem wants, bro. I can't imagine. I've taught over 300 kids in the last five years. They all know who I am, and not one of them has reached out to me. For a homeschool Doesn't make sense Maybe they don't want their kids to get closer to God God forbid But who knows Who knows what it is And then I have some other families that do You know Ask me to come And they hire me And stuff like that That's beautiful And God will bless them You know why? Because they put their ego to the side And they know that I'm amazing When it comes to children And like my father said Don't praise yourself bro. And I just did that And I apologize to Shem I really shouldn't even have spoke about people ignoring my book, whatever. But you know what the beautiful message is? I don't say anything. I keep my mouth closed, just like a nerd. I wish I was a nerd. That's the book. <laughs> ah, Shem, I love you so much. You know why? And I'm so happy, yo, that this happens. That you put me in a situation like that. You know why? Because it shows me not to rely on a rabbi, not to rely on a maintenance guy. Just to only rely on you, the King of Kings, the Holy of Holies, and the most loving and kind God that ever existed or will ever exist. I can't even say existed because it's in the past tense, but Hashem does exist. He was in the past, the future, and the present all at one. That's Hashem. That's what makes Him so special. You can never do that. You can't even do two things at once. He'll do 10 billion things at once. Alright, let's go back to my notes. Perfecto. 
Uh, the mother of Doeg Ben Yosef. Wow, wow, wow. She used to weigh him and take his weight and donate his weight in gold to the temple treasury. And you know what ended up happening? When the famine plagued the streets of Jerusalem, she slaughtered him and ate his flesh. Think about what I just said to you. Wow. The mother, that's in Yoma 38b. I'll give you the source. Doeg Ben Yosef. They used to take him, measure him. The mother loved him so much she would measure him, weigh him, and then take his weight in gold and give it to the temple treasury. But when the famine broke out, she ate him. It just goes to show you the punishment. The second book of Chronicles, chapter 24, 18 to 22 relates how the Jews turned to idol worshipping and God sent Zechariah the son of Yohediah not to be confused with the more famous Zechariah ben Berechiah to rebuke them that's who he sent he sent Zechariah Yohediah to rebuke them the people conspired against him and stoned him think about that they stoned their own prophet as he was dying he cried out to God and said may the Lord take revenge and for hundreds of years, his blood boiled in the temple courtyard. But when Nebuzardan, Nebuchadnezzar's general, entered the courtyard, he was struck in amaze at the sight of the seething blood. He questioned the Jews about the phenomenon, but none of them would answer. Right away, he knew something was wrong. He called out, he said, I will avenge your death. He brought out all the judges and slaughtered them. Then all the youths and the maidens, and he killed them. But the blood did not stop boiling. He took the young children from the schools and massacred 94 dads. Do you even understand what I'm reading to you? You people are on the beach chilling right now, loving life, and you don't even understand what God is going to do to the Jews if they don't follow the Torah. I'm telling you, listen. They killed the prophet, Nebuzardan, the general of, of Nebuchadnezzar, came. He wanted to get revenge for this prophet they killed. Hashem put something in his head. 94,000 souls were destroyed. So he called out, Zechariah, Zechariah, I slew the best of them. And that's when the blood relaxed, man. Wow, that story is so psychotically not normal that I almost don't even believe it. But it's 100% true. They murdered, the Muslims say that about the Jews. Look at them, how ungrateful they are to God. They murdered their own prophet and their rights. Afterwards, Nebuzardan paused to reflect this punishment exacted for the murder of one soul. Look, he said to himself, that's what it was. He said to himself, look at the punishment that happened for this one soul of killing Zechariah. What's going to be the punishment for somebody like me that killed thousands of souls? He returned home divorced his wife and converted to Judaism Sanhedrin 96b give you the source chapter 2 verse 21 in the book of Echa lying on the ground in the streets are young and old my maidens and my young men have fallen by the sword you slew them on the day of your wrath you slaughtered them and showed no pity wow Jeremiah predicted this chapter 6 verse 11 of his book he was speaking about the fury of the Lord and he said I will point to the infants in the streets and to the assemblage of the young men together with the old wow Jeremiah dreamt of an almond tree and he realized it was a sign that his prophecies were speedily coming to fruition in Israel the almond tree is the first tree to blossom these four things may be comparable to death, blindness, leprosy, childlessness, and poverty. And I just want to say, you know, I listen to my talks when I go to sleep. So I just want to give myself a quick message and just say I'm very proud of how you worked on yourself. And I hope to God that you continue to keep working on yourself and keep getting closer and closer to God. You know why? Because there's no limit. Just remember that. There's no limit. And I'm so stuck to you, Hashem. It's crazy. But I can get even more stuck. And even more stuck than that. And even more than that. There is no limit to how high you can ascend. 
spiritually when you want to do it. You can almost, and I say that very reluctantly, almost reach the level of Hashem. Almost. And when I say almost, you know what I mean. You will never, but you will definitely reach the level higher than an angel because the angels don't have free choice. You did, and you overcame your desires. So imagine that. If you're a person that overcame your desires and changed your whole life around, think about how high you can ascend in heaven. It's beautiful. And I feel blessed and honored. And now that I worked on myself, now I want to come and help your children, Hashem. Jews and non-Jews, but mostly my children, the Jews, my brothers, my sisters, to help them to get closer to you, to love you the way I do. Amen. The prayers of a congregation and the sincere prayers of an individual are always heard. Echa, chapter 3, verse 10. This is what it says. He's like a bear lying in wait, a lion in hiding. The bears are generally afraid of the lion. But here God is comparing the bear to the Gentile nations and the lion to the nation of Judah. But here the roles are reversed. The lion was the one that was afraid of the bear. Why? Because when Hashem wants, the roles will be reversed. Just like somebody was rude to you and got rid of you in a job, God can make it one day that you'll be the boss and it'll work for you. I know that's crazy. But I'm just letting you know what can be. Rabbi Yehuda ben Bava gave five of his students smicha when the Romans found out that he was doing this. Not only teaching Torah, but anointing rabbis. They went nuts. They shot 300 arrows into his flesh and killed him. Sanhedrin 14a. During the final year of the kingdom of Judah, the nation was balanced between two world powers, Egypt and Babylon. The land of Israel was often ravaged by conquering armies. They deposed and anointed Judah's kings at will and looted the nation's treasuries. For 22 years, this continued. Wow. And Judah suffered humiliation in front of the Gentile nations. In essence, peace refers to the fusion of two opposites. And the ultimate opposites are spiritual and material. The two are often in conflict, but the Torah can ultimately fuse them both. It allows for the awareness of godliness and spirituality within the context of our material world. This quality is expressed on the Shabbat, where we eat and indulge in material pleasure, but at the same time we elevate our souls. Amen. The most severe punishment a person can suffer, take a guess. This is vicious. And I know somebody that might actually be experiencing this. And now maybe I should have more mercy on him. And you know what the answer is? The most severe punishment a person can suffer is loss of hope. Wow. And sometimes, unfortunately, Hashem humbles the Jewish nation to suffering. It's the Holocaust. I keep using that as an example. That's what it is. The arrogance. And he broke the pride of you. I would never talk like this unless I read his book and quote you direct from him. And that's what he says. God is good to all who seek him. Sometimes difficulties are divine gifts which are intended to elevate and purify us. Be silent for the Lord and wait patiently for him. Psalms 37, 7. Meaning trust God that Mashiach is going to come and he's going to make justice in the world. Moses told the Jews, God will fight for you and you shall be silent. Exodus 14, 14. Trusting God doesn't mean that you're going to trust that everything will be good. No, it's trusting that everything right now will be good. Because people will say, it'll be good, it'll be good. No, no, even now while you're suffering, it's good. That's the level of trust you have to get to. The Lord, and we should never suffer. Lo aleinu ever, but you know, it happens. And it only happens because of sins. Suffering only happens because of good. Now you know, sins. The Lord shall reward the doer of evil according to his wickedness. 
the second book of Samuel 3.39. Repentance establishes a new bond with God. I like that. That's Chuva, Chuva. Without Chuva, I would be dead and you would also be dead. Trust me. And it doesn't mean dead physically. It means dead in the next world. Chas v'chalila. What a punishment. Can you imagine if your punishment wasn't even going to hell, but just watching the reward that the righteous got? That alone would destroy you every day. Jeremiah 48, 40. For he who flees from fear will fall into the pit. Oh my God, Taz and Karen, I hope you guys learned that. You know what that is, man? What a message. I know two Jews that they keep claiming, I don't fear God, I don't fear God. You're not going to pressure me to fear God. It's not good to fear God. And here Jeremiah is telling you, he's a prophet, meaning from God. Those who flee from fearing me will fall into a pit. Why? I tell you why. Because your ego is making you not fear God. What do you mean he's pressuring you? Just put your ego down. When the cops pressure you because you're going to get a ticket, you do it. So why? I don't understand. Come on, man. Let's be real about it. Yo, and I say that with love because these two people I really care about and I like because they're good people. It says that during the fall of Betar, the Romans cruelly slew 50,000 children, wrapping them in Torah scrolls and setting them afire, ablaze. Three sages were cast into a pit, Yosef, Yirmiyahu, and Daniel. Jeremiah was imprisoned by Setkia, a punishment for saying a prophecy about the fall of Jerusalem. And look what ended up happening to Setkia. Ten of his children were murdered in his face. Yo, wow, 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 wow. Deuteronomy 37, may the Lord place all these curses upon your enemies. Ah, Men, can you hear at song of Aja 1 4? Although you soar aloft like the eagle and place your nest amongst the strong, from there I will bring you down, declares God. Oh, I like that. Although you soar aloft like the eagle and place your nest amongst the strong, that's talking to all the arrogant and pompous leaders with strength and power. Look what God did to Governor Cuomo. From there I will bring you down. And I will make your enemies disrespect you. And we're going to end it like this. Disrespect. <laughs> Even the criminal deserves respect. Who do we learn it from? Hashem. Hashem, when he hangs somebody, he does it only for maybe a minute. From their hands. In front of all the people so they should see what will happen to the criminal. But right away, out of respect for him meaning the criminal for Hashem and for the land, right away he buries him. Queen Jezebel got buried. you understand what's going on? But then there's also a story of one of the kings got, got buried. Oh my God. In the body of a donkey, man. You see, when Hashem wants you to suffer embarrassment for eternity, you'll suffer it for eternity. When he wants you to get buried, you'll get buried. When he wants you to get lost and not found, you'll get lost and not found. And Hashem, I want to thank you for finding my cousin Paulie when he drowned in Dahab in Egypt. And we got uh, permission from Mubarak. My family got permission from the Egyptian president or king, whatever he was. And they let us in. And we recovered the body of Paulie. And may this lecture be in the name of my cousin Paul. Him I really love, man. Died scuba diving in Dahab. Paulie, I miss you so much, my brother, man. If you were alive today, I know we would be best friends. I know it. We were best friends while you were alive. We had a bond. And I miss that bond because I don't have it with anybody else the way I had it with you. With you, it was so real, like she just said. And I remember the last time I saw you at the restaurant. Paul Pelino, I miss you, my brother, man. I miss you a lot, man. And I miss your father, Avram. Yo, yo, yo. When I was dating this girl, bro, and I got depressed, I'm not embarrassed to say it. For three months, man, I was depressed because I thought things would work out, and they didn't. And everybody in my family was tough, tough love. Get over it. Ah, what are you, baby? What are you crying? Ah, ah. You know who's the only one that gave me love? Avram. 
I'll never forget. He goes, you know, hey, listen, sometimes we go through things, you know what I'm saying? It's her loss. You're a great kid. And things happen, you know what I'm saying? But don't let it bring you down, man. I love you, and I'm here for you. You want to eat something? It's the best cook ever. God, if he was here right next to me right now, I would ask him to make something for me. And he would. This guy will make a steak using salt and pepper in 10 minutes, and it'll be the best steak you ever ate in your life. How? I don't know. I don't know. I really don't know, bro. I just know that something in his soul made him the most amazing cook ever. 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 And I eat a lot of food from a lot of people. And my family, we have some good cooks. Nobody comes close. Nobody. But one thing I remember right now, and I didn't know her so well, my, my Safta Rachma. Man, she made Zeppelis, the little small Zeppelis, crunchy with the sugar, powdered sugar. Nobody made Zeppelis like my Safta Rachman. And that's Uncle Avram's mom. And that's my mom's mom. And now that I'm talking about people I love, I talk about my mom. Dear God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of my forefathers, the God of justice, the God of anger and fury and wrath, and the God who brings justice to the world. Please take care of my mother. Do not make her suffer. And if she has to, reduce it. Help her to keep Shabbat, Hashem. I gave her a lot of great information about Shabbat. Please help her with that. And please have mercy on her. And please do not ever let me see her in pain and suffering. Amen. Can you hear that song? Love you, Hashem.